Yes, we're live now, I think. So yes, we uh, are. welcome also to the viewers on YouTube. Welcome mm. everyone. Uh, for the first part of the Kaleidoscope series. Um, and um, maybe we, we, have a, we have a tentative idea about how we want to do this, right, Flavia? Uh, which has never been tested before, so it's something of a, of a, of a, of a kind of new thing for us, I think, uh, as Meta Hefmet also, from your side, to, to give a more dialogue-like type of presentation together, no? Uh, the idea, well, we thought about this seminar, and uh, this is also in the introduction that we wrote together with Meta Haven, uh, that we wanted this to not be a traditional lecture series where Daniel gives his talk, I give my talk, people can ask questions. Instead, we divided this in sort of blocks uh, which touch on these topics that we want to explore. And uh, funny enough, this style fits me better because I prefer writing in, in smaller blocks that are very focused rather than extensive lecture essay format. So we will see how that goes, but consider this also a living laboratory, if you will. <laughs> yeah, it very much is. And I think, um, um, yeah, it's just maybe good to, to just pick somebody who starts, um, who, who, who wants to go first, um, so we can kick this off. You go first, Daniel. I'm very happy with that because oh, your introductions afraid. tend to be a lot stronger than mine. Oh, no false modesty here, Flavia. That's, uh, I mean, <laughs> from my perspective, I wanted to say the same thing about you, that I would prefer you to start. Uh, but that having said that, let's let's just begin, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So can you see um, this graphic? Very much so. Good. Okay. Well, that's the first slide. Um, of course, um, you know, people have seen this image before. Uh, it's the protagonist from Tarkovsky's film Nostalgia, um, sitting in what in the film is a kind of like, you know, landscape. Uh, and he's... Uh, in front of a dacha, like a summer house. And that whole thing is then encapsulated in a Gothic cathedral in Italy. So it's sort of like a summer house, but then it's encapsulated into a much bigger wrapper. And instead of the summer house, now there is a Guangzhou Bottega um, padded uh, cassette bag, uh, which is a very uh, nifty, um, replica of the cassette, the padded cassette handbag, uh, and the the theme of um, say fiction uh, and uh, fake and authentic, etc., will be a running thread throughout these series. So um, it will not be a series about Tarkovsky. I want to like, emphasize that on beforehand. But uh, it just is really fun to implement, to put these uh, replica bags into, let's say, film stills and, and, and disturb this, the kind of like austerity and, and, and kind of like serious mood of these film stills with uh, materials that, you know, pose certain questions to us. And those are questions that we will be exploring, you know, in this seminar series. Um, Originally wanted to start on Vinka and mine behalf with a long quote from Dostoevsky, but I'm going to like skip that quote um, and <laughs> moving into the second uh, slide. So, so during the pandemic, we've been constantly keeping each other company uh, on various chat programs. Um, and these are usually it's, it's iMessage, but sometimes it's also WhatsApp when the images do not load. And there is a more or less constant exchange of absurdities in these chats. And we wanted to bring, you know, some of these absurdities and some of these things to you in this lecture format, you know, to share maybe what, what could amount to a kind of like celebration of kitsch and also a, a form of media critique in some way or another. And of course, the tropes that are familiar from both sides, uh, Flavia and Metahaven will, be, will uh, you know, come, come through. So there will be a lot of talking about the topics that you've heard each of us talk about, 
but now it will be mixed up into a kaleidoscope. And the kaleidoscope is very dialogical in that we are um, engaged in this very much together and unfinished material uh, and uh, you know snippets were sort of like very much okay, we told each other, at least for this first episode where we're testing out the format. So um, with that being said, uh, thanks so much again for joining. Um, so, so another thread that will run through this uh, series is cinema. Um, why are we so interested in cinema? You know, firstly, of course, because of um, the aspect of creating it, but also from the aspect of what is cinema in our lives? What, you know, why do we use, I do not have the graphic at hand right now, but the, the word cinematic has uh, seen a, uh, you know, incremental increase in use uh, in the last few years, and we're interested why that is, you know, and also we're seeing, of course, in the pandemic and the COVID, um, you know, situation, we see a, a sort of collapse of what the movie theater did for films. So we see major, major mega films uh, having, you know, box office revenues of, you know, that are lower than art house films, more or less, which is a very weird situation. And it causes a kind of, it, it, it gives a, a really good, I think, context to question what film is uh, and also what it, you know, potentially can be. And in, in this dialogue that Flavia and, has been having with us and we with her, uh, the more, let's say, hilarious films of recent coinage, you know, have, have been pre pre predominantly discussed. And, and one of those films is, you know, in spite of many, you know, of its, uh, let's say, technical and acting achievements, there's a lot to be said about Christopher Nolan's Tenet. Uh, from 2020, but that will not happen during this talk. This is just a preview of the, let's say the next, um, the iterations to come. So this is actually, uh, I would say, shortly an intro. Um, this is an, actually a film, Sig Sig Solaris, that Flavia and Meta even have been planning to make for some time, but has never materialized yet. Uh, the, the plan for this film was made in 2019 and it's now, you know, we're two years into, into that and there's no, like, there's no um, scenario yet, but perhaps we're constantly writing something like that actually during this process. So that would be an interesting prospect. So this first episode is um, called Overture of Something That Never Ended. Uh, and the title of this episode is based on a film that Gucci released in 2020 on their YouTube channel, actually part of a series of films directed by Gus Van Sant. Uh, and uh, this has been, you know, we were discussing this film and what it, what, it, what it does for the cinematic and also certain thoughts about fashion and other thoughts that, you know, Flavia will talk about in a minute, I guess. But that was the reason we called it overture of something that never ended. We're like talking about an overture of our series, but we're also discussing um, using this as a jumping platform, more or less to, to discuss certain things together. Um, that being said, um, we have the agreement that when one stops sharing, the other starts. And this is actually my moment to stop sharing and give over to Flavia. Um. It, it's funny, I have so many commentary and also my own texts. I will share my own uh, screen also because it ties to something that you were saying uh, just about uh, the overture of something that never ended. And I <laughs> very cheekily changed that, which ties to Six Six Solaris as well, because this is an overture of something that never even began. Uh, in a lot of ways. And, and I, I'm interested in this notion of the padded cassette bag as um, something that is disruptive, because I believe that the replica, and I will touch on that in a, in a moment, is um, disruptive in itself because of how it disturbs uh, signals of class. 
and signals of what type of, of people should have access to these luxury goods. So I like the idea of having this replica in the background of our visuals, if anything, as an intrusion, something that is not, not only not authentic, but in the world of luxury, it's even offensive and hurtful uh, to, to be seen there. Um, when, when this pandemic uh, hit, I was trying to recover and I read from my notes because I have an extensive body of notes for all of these. Um, I was trying to recover from very severe illness that left me permanently disabled. I spent countless days and nights in emergency rooms, went through so many tests and lab works that I no longer felt I had a body. Um, this, I called it, this thing. And I remember the time that I ate an overwhelmingly large dose of assurescence mushrooms. And in almost complete darkness, I looked at my feet and my hands and I saw claws like those of an alien from a 50s movie. I was not alarmed or in panic. I just simply came to the conclusion that this body wasn't mine, that I was something else entirely. Now, years later, I would revive the same sense of alienation from my body every day. This arm that they prick with needles is not mine. These legs that I can no longer sustain me are someone else's. This pain that consumes me every day is just happening to someone that is not me. The Dutch medical system has a funny way of dealing with these things. Every symptom, no matter how big or overwhelming, is to be weighted out. Eventually, it will be either receding or it will become so unbearable that something will have to be done. Wait and see, they repeat. From March 2020, when this dialogue that led to this overture of something that never be even began, um, started, this dreaded Calvinist approach to healthcare would become the national response to another deadly disease. My body, individually neglected or alternative prodded, connected to cables and machines. And I remember, Daniel, when I would send you uh, photos from <laughs> IC, I was connected to these cardiology machines and I would uh, WhatsApp him photos of me connected to cables. This body that was connected to these machines was now a mirror of the body collective. The sense of inevitability of predestination has been the hallmark of the response to the pandemic. Waiting and seeing when you're seriously ill acquires a kaleidoscopic character, exploding into multiple directions of meaning. Wait and see if it is worth to spend healthcare money on this. Wait and see if destiny has a cure for you. Wait and see if your immune system fights back. Wait and see if nature just takes its course. Wait and see as the embodiment of a theology that exonerates any apathy or budget cutting measure because we are just in God's hands anyway. We discuss Walter Benjamin's arcade project with Daniel. He asks me if I have read any of Benjamin's writers on Baudelaire, but I cannot find the exact passage. Instead, I come across this. The peculiar resolution of the flaneur, just as waiting seems to be the proper state of the impassive thinker, that appears to be that of the flaneur. An elegy by Schiller contains the phrase, the hesitant wing of the butterfly. This points to that association of winchness with the feeling of indecision, which is so characteristic of hashish intoxication. I reflect on this while trying to re-feel the alien body of claws and no feet. Is there a word for re-feeling? Why is there a word for bringing back facts to one's mind? that is recalling them, but there is none for this refilling of an affective memory. Maybe that is precisely the sentimentality we often discuss with Daniel. Rather than calling it a 
refilling of a past affective state, they gave it a seemingly rational word that removes it from the scope of the incontrollable. If sentimentality is the being overwhelmed by feelings of the past, wouldn't then it be a sort of refilling? Um, thank you. Yeah, I should. I sh we should have probably mentioned something about the about the the the, the Gucci video. But may will you do that later on? Flavio? Yes. Yeah. Oh no, no. Great. Would okay. I do that? Yeah, you will. Right. Okay. Good. <laughs> Would I not? I wanted to respond just to your first part of the introduction of how we got here. Yes. Right. Right. So we should we should mention that the the film features uh, Paul Prichado as well. Uh, and we'll get to that. Um, so, so Flavia talks about the, the body a lot, and, and it is also sort of bodily sensations that perhaps, you know, over, over, are overwhelmingly present in our experience of films right now, because simply so much comes at us through this sort of, you know, the space of the, the ocular and the, the eyes and everything. So this is something to, you know, take into account when, we, when we're talking about film. So going to talk a little bit about Zoom fatigue and film fatigue. Um, <clears throat> I'm watching one of the many car review videos that I've been watching on YouTube recently. I can say that the pandemic incrementally enlarged the already considerable amount of time that I spent on YouTube. And of late, as I said, it's been car videos from the US vlogger Doug DeMuro. Now I want to quickly add that I don't have a driving license. I've once taken driving lessons, but it was nothing for me. Yet despite all that, I've been very much into cars since young age. As a designer by training, I'm interested in the way Doug DeMuro reviews cars. He is known for spending a lot of time with that, what he calls a car's quirks and features, meaning where certain controls are and how certain things work that are peripheral to a car's core functioning and performance. Things like the windshield wiper switches, the air vents, climate controls, the entertainment switches, the door handles, etc. Really enjoy, you know, talking about these types of details. The way these quirks and features work, where they are placed, how they expect the occupants of the car to approach and handle them, what they reveal and don't reveal about themselves and the way in which they want to be perceived, how they look and what they're made of speaks volumes about interface and especially about how interface is created based around explicit and implicit expectations of users' behavior, their bodies, uh, their minds, which in turn shape how these same users like or dislike what they get. And in the comments below one of DeMuro's videos, a review of a recent Volkswagen electric car, I read something like that button for such and such function, and I forgot which one it was, sorry, is like the meeting to plan a meeting, talking about the sort of tautology of, functionali of functionalities that can, uh, you know, that can emerge in, a, in an interface. <clears throat> now we do all know, and most of us know the Zoom meeting and the way it leaves all you feeling afterward, wondering like it really happened or not. And if you really experienced something or whether a simulacrum just flew through you, passed through you. This doesn't count for all online experiences like that, but it counts for some of them. I think that's tangentially interesting to start with cars, quirks and features, interfaces and Zoom, not just to repeat to you the most obvious truisms of pandemic era everyday relationships with the screen, but to set the scene or better a part of the scene, if only some props for the engagement with the cinematic that this series is also about. Every Saturday, a German art magazine sends me an automated push notification with the 10 most recommended free to watch art house features of that weekend. <clears throat> And to, um, and to be honest, the idea of having to act on the notification tires me. It tires me because I have already been on my screen for the whole week. I have seen little else than it. For a large part of the week, 
been on Jitsi, Zoom, or worse, Teams, and simply cannot vacate the same space in the imagination once more for it to become the carrier of an art house film. And these are, by the way, the pedals of that new electric Volkswagen. The drive pedal has a video play button sign, and the brake pedal has a video pause button sign. It would be tempting to see this as a designer gimmick, and it also is. Having these video play and pause signs on the pedals doesn't fundamentally change what the driving does, or does it? What they maybe change is how we think about what the pedals do. Driving becomes playing the film. Braking becomes pausing the film. For those who are like Vinka and myself, already convinced that cinema has become unleashed forever from its confinement to what we traditionally see as recording equipment, movie theaters, plot and duration to simply occupy everything and go everywhere and be everything. These VW pedals are not designer gimmicks, but telltale signs of that exactly happening. So having a materialist look at things affirms the viewpoint too, right? Clicking play on an art house film on Mubi or a car video on YouTube sets in motion a data delivery process powered by electricity. And the result is that we see the film. Pushing the drive pedal delivers energy from the battery to the car's engine mechanics and it starts to drive. The deadpan reality that both these things come down to the electric energy transfer brings us face to face with the possibility that at least some of this newly cinematic reality is about physics alone. Surely the pandemic has, at least for me, almost completely nullified my direct contact with carbon slurping apparatuses like airplanes to the point where I dearly miss the stench of kerosene. The 2020 first lockdown's empty blue skies were about that temporary reshuffle of some of the most prominent sources of carbon away from our deck, from our direct, from our deck direct line vision. But I think that these play button and these pause button ultimately bring us in contact with you know questions that we can ask about the earth and about our relationship with the earth and the planet and you know ways in which these things are entangled and entwined so we're not talking about you know cinema some like rt thing but it's really you know connected to those sort of physical properties thank you we can't hear you, Flavia. Muted. I'm unmuted now. Yes. Uh, it's uh, funny that you mention uh, these uh, interfaces, uh, Daniel, especially in the context of uh, what I wanted to discuss next. Um, what you are describing, I, I would say, falls into the category of some of our discussions in regards to an epistemological crisis. And, um, Francis Bale and Robert Harriman, they have created this repository of um, academic work and research and theory around uh, the COVID, not just as an epidemi epidemiological disruption, but also an epistemological uh, one. And I think that what you are saying about interfaces very much intersects with this notion of the epistemological uh, crisis. I read during the, our discussions, I read um, Marcella Althaus reads Indecent Theology, and I quote from her, every theology implies a conscious or unconscious sexual and political praxis based on reflections and actions developed from certain accepted codifications. These are theosocial codifications which configure epistemologies visions of life and the mystical projections which relate human experience to the sacred. Who deserves to be saved? Who has already lived a completed life? Whose life is livable anyway? Those questions are implicitly enunciated every time a new measure is announced. Throughout these months that we have been uh, discussing the, this epistemological crisis, every week practically a new measure to contain the COVID uh, advance is, is announced. 
while there is obviously no contemporary footprint for the management of a pandemic of these dimensions, there is certainly an epistemological one that informs how much value is assigned to this preservation of life. An empire that was founded on a template of genocide and occupation will not suddenly develop tenderness and a preoccupation for human suffering. Instead, the empire shows its bureaucratic teeth at every turn, back and forth with measures and countermeasures that contradict whatever was said or done the day before, saving face on the face of today's elections specifically becomes much more important than saving living and breathing faces from premature death. So like Daniel watches car videos, when the full weight of March 2020 fell on us, I reacted in the only way I know how to. I started giving back life to things that had been discarded. I took these objects that had one been had once been luxury, but were now one step removed from being considered debris. And I breathed into them in the same way I wished someone could breathe into my broken body. I took these decaying things and I made them look opulent once again. I shined them, I conditioned their skins in ways that my own skin cannot be conditioned back to the pre days. If I was going to live in a Calvinist pandemic, I was going to resist through coats of acrylic wrestling and patient restitching. By November 2020, when Gucci released their spring summer campaign in the form of a series of films co-directed by Gus Van Sant and Alessandro Michele, we were living in pandemic anomie. I have spent the past four years researching the anthologies of algorithms, the taxonomical constructions that constitute the basis of our technologies. And now I find myself immersed in a Mill Dorkham's taxonomy of collective violence. I ponder how these taxonomies of race and gender I have spoken about extensively in turn feed the taxonomies of violence that shape our responses to the pandemic. Dorkheim's ontologies are inapprehensible for me because unlike Kantian notions of beauty or Linnean taxonomies of race, which are quantified, qualified, and gave a granularity to, categories of violence acquire a liquid quality once I try to understand them in the same framework. I wonder how a surveillance algorithm jumps from the taxonomy of race, gender, or citizenship into a taxonomy of propensity to crime. I realize that one of the reasons I cannot apprehend these taxonomies of violence, their liquidity, their almost ethereal quality, is because I am trying to quantify social taxonomies of moral behavior. As such, I can only deal in the materiality of quantified data. How many people committed this crime? How many people refuse to wear a mask? How many are purposefully interacting with others while sick? This data, if it existed, would provide a landscape of inanimate objects. It would say nothing about the motivations for the pandemic anomie. The coloniality of the algorithm that I have theorized ad nauseum morphed into an ontology of morality. It is in this context that I watch Paul Preciado's cameo in Gucci's film. He talks about the fiction of binary sex that was invented in the 16th century as part of colonial occupation and the invention of the fictional categories of race. On the one hand, I feel validated in my research of the past four years. On the other hand, Gucci does not make clothes that fit my body. So I ask Daniel, what do these gestures even mean? Daniel believes, or at least believed in November 2020, and that might mean something else today, given the constant flux that we find ourselves in, that this means Gucci might be catching up with the times. Maybe Gucci is trying to make itself relevant. 
But then I didn't think more about it, but this notion that a fashion powerhouse can simultaneously introduce masses of people to the ideas of coloniality, racial and gender hierarchies, while at the same time refusing to include bodies like mine in their product offering, did not sit well with me. Not because I plan to buy their clothes anytime soon, but because I insist with my question, what do these gestures mean? And I don't want to fall into simplistic answers around neoliberal absorption of cool or edgy ideas. Because A, such answer would be extremely limiting and partial. And B, because in any given cultural phenomenon, usually there is a multiplicity of factors that come together. I often talk of the prismatic nature of my approach to criticality. That is looking at the facets that make the whole. So yes, neoliberal absorption is one aspect, but I do believe phrenology is another. If Carl Linnaeus gave us the systems of organization that divided us in strict categories, separated by phenotypical characteristics, <clears throat> we ought to count the universalizing theories of aesthetics that assign values to these categories. The careful examination in Kant's theories of beauty, using ratios and equations to separate the non-whites from any conception of beauty, underpinned Linnaeus' strict racial divisions. And it was phrenology, a pseudoscience from the 18th century, whose inventor claimed that through careful measurements of the skull and face, he could predict character and moral traits that by the 19th century further expanded Kantian ontologies of beauty and gave them a veneer of medical scientific rigor by not only associating beauty to morality, but also to physical characteristics. I will not extend myself in the history of phrenology, but suffice to say that by the 19th century, it was already widely used to enforce the supposed superiority of white people whose cranial and facial structures were deemed to be optimal over any other race and ethnicity. Phrenology became foundational, not only to scientific racism, but also contemporary sexism and ableism in that it ascribed moral superiority to faces and heads that only fit a very narrow scope of whiteness. And as you can see in these prints that I'm sharing now, it was also extremely hegemonic in the way it defined hierarchies of morality also within whiteness. Phrenology cementing the notion that having a certain body type of looking a certain way made someone superior, more virtuous, better. Fashion, never really shredded phrenology's influence. Uh, thank you, Flavia. Um, yeah, I think that really uh, speaks to those, uh, you know, videos um, that aside from the, the fact that they're explorations in a medium that's an alternative to the to the catwalk show, let's say, and that, that, you know, that the content of the videos and the people involved do present, you know, a progression from, you know, values that a, a lot of values that are, you know, you know, um, are, are traditionally associated with a luxury brand. There still is that phrenological um, aspect that sort of retains. And I, I imagine that's what you mean by, um, overture of something that never even began. They never even began to shred that, right? Say something. I know we had this discussion where when you saw the slide with the title that I changed, you were like, what, we are changing the title now? Rightfully so. And I couldn't quite articulate why. <laughs> but now you, you see exactly what I was coming from. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So uh, the, our viewers, which, uh, which I, we thank once again for joining, uh, might be wondering how, when is there going to be a point of intersection besides of the intersection that's been there 
all the time because of the way that our 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 narratives are um, sort of like entangled with each other. But there will be points where where they cross or where they meet. Um, I think uh, let's let's go there perhaps. Minting fictions and collectible facts. So this is about NFTs, and I I want to say on beforehand, it's not the final word on NFTs. So those of you that are involved in um, studying them, minting them, etc., do not feel like you know we're gonna you know do a really pessimistic of anal analysis of NFTs because it's just like a, a moment a moment in which you know we express our feelings and thoughts about it. But this is constantly in flux, of course. Nevertheless, minting fictions and collectible facts. Our contact with the electric-only processes and their interfaces has duly increased, I think, at the expense of being in direct acquaintance with carbon pollution. Indoor life has further uh, intensified our entanglement with electronic-powered plot lines. Films are electronic objects. They're products of calculus, computation, rendering, as we say. They, they can be expressed in duration, Resolution, time, like duration, but also energy. Digital artworks governed by blockchain technologies called NFTs, mean, meaning non-fungible tokens, possess a considerable energy footprint as electronic objects. The fact, or digital objects, the fact that at the time of this writing, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey is minting his first ever tweet as an NFT, shows the cruelty and weirdness that's happening when specific informational coordinates from shared time, such as tweets, become signed Bitcoin objects in some kind of Duchampian bargain with the underlying materiality of the currency being energy again, plus art world exclusion and exclusivity scarcity added to that. An exclusion, it should be said, that makes the NFT minting business rather like the gallery system and not like the proletarian revolution of unpaid digital makers that it purports to be. Bitcoin and similar digital currencies are, among other things, money, gold, tulips, and fiction all in one. The eventual owner of Dorsey's tweet owns a piece of digital code, a copy of the tweet, uh, and its metadata inexorably linked to Dorsey's digital signature. And that's really what there is to it. Can the NFT principle potentially also apply to deleted tweets and suspended profiles? Can, for example, an individual who has had their Twitter profile removed mint an NFT out of that deleted profile in one way or another, just as there are musical pieces that consist of silence or artworks that consist of the gallery being closed and so on. I'm emphatically not saying that this should happen or that it would be a good idea or thing to do so. Rather, I'm saying that insofar both an existing and a deleted tweet are real or have been part of reality, their minting into a currency can be real. And that in itself shows perhaps some of the weird worlds of fiction and fantasy that we will shed light on bit by bit during this series, Kaleidoscope. So we do connect the NFTs to fiction as well. So this is something that I think is relevant to say because for you know a significant amount of people interested in NFTs, I presume that they these are they consist they're the opposite of fiction, they're the most real thing that you could potentially think about. And just to be clear, I consider NFTs already weird as is and fiction as is precisely because of the insistence that they are real value in capital letters. In other words, not just your ordinary JPEG or tweet next door, but minted, encased with blockchain and signature frozen out of the liquid chaos like real golden ice. Literally, no one has said to my knowledge, let's, who has said, let's mint NFTs, has also, to my knowledge, said, let's pay our collaborators. Those two sentences seem mutually exclusive. And I think we can safely assume that the monetary value that arises out of the NFTs calculus and its massive energy footprint 
is decoupled from any norms or form of social contract. <clears throat> now imagine the museum scene in the film Children of Men, but instead with a lone Guernica, the collector is sitting with Jack Dorsey's first tweet. I wanted to say something, Daniel, about your comment uh, about um, the topics intersecting or the fragmentation of what we talk about. Um, part of what this series is about is bodies and technology. And it will be evident, or it is evident already in uh, the one hour almost that we are already talking, how the approach to bodies and technology acquires this kaleidoscopic uh, nature. How you can say, well, this is fragmented and precisely that's the point, that fragmentation. And I, I believe at least for me, aesthetically and ethically, this fragmentation should be reflected in the way that we jump from one topic to another. And I think that what makes this interesting is how we, you are discussing the interface and I'm discussing the body as interface of something else. So it's not as disconnected as it might a priori appear, at least to me. Uh, but if you want to respond, please. No, I believe you're right. I believe that this sort of prismatic or, uh, or like kaleidoscopic approach uh, is uh, what um, also makes our work or the way that we, we do this different from, let's say, what would happen in a more purely, you know, uh, academic environment, for example, where, you know, where we could say that those, those, those things are more separated. Uh, and I also believe that, and this is something you know, your intro spoke to greatly, I think. But but um, that that our that the way that this intersects with our livelihoods, and our let's say our being as people is also really important for this series. So it's not merely the conclusions of a, of a, of an analysis of something that sort of like happens out there, but it's also about um, you know moments in which these things start to. Are, are really entwined with our existence. And I think that the, for us, the, the, the pandemic has also meant in a certain sense, a kind of slowdown on many fronts. I think for many people it has. And I think we're beyond the point that we find that all really Zen and stuff like that. And that it's all like, you know, really leading to sort of more mindfulness, but we're also like, we, we just get way more time to spend with, um, with, things to think about. And I think that that also uh, prompted a lot of the conversations, but also the, this series. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the things that we, we talk about are things that are in flux, right? So they're not finite, they're not finished, etc. And I think that's also, we could, whilst I think the positions will stay consistent more or less during the series, our points of view can evolve during the series. So also with regard to NFTs, it's going to come a, bit, a little bit more later, but there is um, obviously these things are in flux as well. Indeed, and I want to talk a bit more about uh, this notion of the body as interface. Um, this is um, David Keeble, a pretty influential man that you likely never heard of. While Gucci does not ascribe, ascribe to uh, Kibbe's theories, at least that I know of, I'm, I'm, I haven't spoken to Alessandro Michele to know um, if, if, he, if they do. Uh, but Kibbe's theories do play a part of an overall ethos within fashion. This is the phrenology and the characterology that continue living on the way uh, that these products are, are produced and marketed. Uh, David Kieber came up with this template of uh, body types to determine what you should wear and the type of styles that would fit your body. Needless to say, the Kieber taxonomical order only applies to cisgender women. 
A simple Google search will provide hundreds of thousands of tests to determine your Kiba body type. The clothes that match that style, discussion boards painstakingly arguing the minutia of one's hip circumference and into which body type it should be assigned, the colors that match each of these types, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Instagram algorithm indexes thousands of posts on keep, keep a body type of aesthetics each week. The algorithmic ontologies of beauty interact with this system of classification so that we can scroll through the fashion that would best suit us. All of this to say, this is not some niche small topic within fashion. This is one of the backbone topics that make the endless cycle of discussion and debates in fashion forums. According to this taxonomical order, women fall into one of four categories, dramatic, natural, romantic, or gammon. This man categorizes women by 13 different types, divided by yin, soft features, and young, sharp features, based on the following, bone structure, body flesh, facial features. All four body types share the same set of characteristics, just as gender, thin, white, and able-bodied. Some of these photo sets sometimes include a woman of color, and I suppose, if I'm going to be honest, that this is done to divert the obvious racial commentary that this taxonomical order uh, can elicit from people discussing it. This strict division of bodies includes measurements, characteristics, and descriptions that recall the measurements that notable phrenologist and one of the founders of criminology, Cesare Lombroso, used to perform on women of the 19th century. Lombroso was a proponent of measuring physical characteristics to determine the criminality of the subjects he studied. Lest anyone believes that Lombroso's ideas are a thing of the past, predictive algorithms developed by the police or by intelligence services across the Western world operate under the same logic. The way someone looks determines their morality and propensity to crime, and algorithms just measure the potential for criminality based on factors like race and physical posture. This Lombrosian fashion artifact is not limited to just body types. In a move that recalls the operations of predictive police algorithms, the body types are assigned personality characteristics. This is how we learn that the romantic type is ruled by her ovaries. No explanation provided about the woman born, born without ovaries or the trans woman whose body is never even considered in these charts. This romantic type of woman is also an achiever, an active listener, cares about others, etc. It is here that phrenology meets another 19th century pseudoscience, characterology, or the study of how body types could predict personality traits. I asked earlier, what does Gucci's gesture of including Preciado's ideas around coloniality and the formation of racial hierarchies mean in the context of a luxury fashion house does that, that does not make clothes for bodies like mine? Fashion did not come to this phrenologist approach to design on its own. In race, bodies, and beauty, fat, desire, and disgust in the colonial imagination, Christopher Forth traces the way that our notions of what constitutes beauty and what is considered desirable were shaped by the colonial interventions of the 17th and 18th centuries. While Kant cemented the quote-unquote correct proportions and racial configurations of the beautiful body, white, of course, in Western thoughts. His ideas were certainly part of an overall belief system that placed the European body as superior to any other physical configuration. 
And I quote from uh, Christopher Ford's research, which if anyone is uh, interested, it's, it's available for download uh, as a PDF. You just have to Google the title and the name. Uh, and I quote from Ford, Julian Duvivier kaleidoscopic depiction of the Casbah in his 1937 film, Pepe Le Mocol, all labyrinthine streets and passageways, and teeming with a bewildering array of nationalities and ethnicities, provides a textbook example of the Orientalist mindset famously analyzed by Edward Said. All is twisted and deformed in the old world city of Algiers from its dark, slimy, and quote unquote putrid streets to the bodies and morals of, of the inhabitants, especially those of the women. It was here that the European would encounter girls of all nations, shapes, and sizes. Everything from the tall and short to the ageless and shapeless. Pieces of fat, and this is a quote, that no one would dare approach. And, and in French, the abîme de Grey, or nul no se, se risque. This rather bizarre phrase is a throwaway line, neither explained nor repeated in the movie, but it adds to Duvivier's unsavory portrait of the Casper, the gist of which he probably assumed viewers would grasp the ways in which the Caspa women are photographed. And here in the screen, you can see uh, how the camera work uh, is done, provides clues to what this phrase might mean. One of the fat ladies is shot from below to convey her towering bulk, while another is shot from above to reveal by way of her souping neckline the depth into which men might plunge. Um, this is the image that I am currently showing at, at the left side of the screen. We know where the camera was positioned in relation to these bodies, but from what heights might a man have to fall before reaching such fleshy uh, areas? What is at stake in Caspa's corpulence is a tension between what it, its inhabitants consider beautiful and the putatively superior taste of the quote unquote civilized viewer. Strictly speaking, after all, one cannot say that no one will approach these women who would have most likely been recognized as sex workers. French physicians, explorers, and ethnographers have long commented on how often female corpulence, that is, fat women, were considered desirable in North Africa and the Levant, and the numerous studies of Algeria reinforced this impression. But men from these reg regions were not the implied viewers of this film. Rather, it was the unmarked white French viewer who might conclude that no one would quote unquote dare approach such slippery slopes. Such people, Duvivier, the director of the film, assumes would naturally recoil in disgust at the sight of grossly fat bodies, which in the metropole, that is in Paris, have become increasingly unacceptable. In France, as well as in other countries, the colonial world conjured images of bodies that by the 1930s had been long dismissed as disgusting and uncivilized. Pepe Le Moco, the film, encapsulates attitudes towards fat that transcend national boundaries. And later on, uh, Christopher Forth adds, if the bustle was generally seen as a false bottom and thus a tailor-made approximation of large buttocks, there was enough real corpulence around to satisfy those seeking to draw class-based distinctions between respectable bourgeois bellies and the vulgar fat of the lower orders. Sex workers, for instance, were commonly said to grow very fat due to warm baths and sedentary and overindulgent animal lives that they led. Viewing such claims through a colonial lens, Cesare Lombroso even connected 
corpulence and sex work with racial inferiority in his de depiction of black women. Disturbing examples of savage desires at home were noted elsewhere as well. We know that an uh, end bone point, that is the plump part of a person's body, if I'm going to be very vulgar, the ass, um, that was the standard of female beauty. Uh, Edouard Kellier, who was the first European to reach Timbuktu in Africa, came back from Timbuktu with an observation about how the people of Timbuktu only liked fat women. When required of girls outside of the West, excessive ass was also represented as a means of su female subordination. Acknowledging such subtle connections between desire and power, several commentators proposed that the pleasure many non-Western men took in excessively fat females also reflected a wish to dominate women. Variations of that claim that Oriental ladies are fattened for matrimony, as we in this Western world fattened pigs for the market, were made throughout the century, as were complaints about how the bodies of such women were nourished at the expense of their souls, leaving them sensual, indolent, and vain. I could go on describing the way that uh, the colonizer viewed non-white women as simultaneously repulsive and possessed by animal-like appetites. I must recall in this context, the atrocities inflicted on Sarah Bartman, the South African Khoi Khoi woman, who in the 19th century was exhibited as a carnival attraction due to the shape of her body. I will not share any images of her in these talks because I believe that there is a post-mortem revictimization of Bartman every time we continue reproducing the images of her torment. While the images are widely available on the internet, I believe we do not need to participate in this perpetual phenomenon of the humanization in order to discuss the relevance of her life. The French archaeologist Edouard Piet almost certainly had Bartman in mind when he dubbed his most famous find the Venus of Brassempuy. Upon discovering other figurines with more slender bodies and flat stomachs, the archaeologist speculated that two human races must have existed during the Paleolithic era. One fat and hairy, and the other thin and hairless who hated one another. In his letters, this archaeologist even describes a gradual transition from an old fat-hipped race to a modest and slender race that was more civilized than the other and ended up conquering it. We should also mention, as Christopher Forth elaborates in his research, the 19th century tendency to depict sex workers as being fat rather than thin, cementing these associations between excess flesh and deviant uh, sexuality. I'm going to unshare for now. Well, when I can, I don't know. Right, so, yeah. Um, don't give us your slide. Don't give us the next slide, but thank you so much. Like, the, it, it's interesting how the the film still, you know, we, we shared the one film still from the Gucci film, and it, it really has such a backstory if we if we sort of dig into this. So I think it, it, sh it also shows a sort of depth. And I think it also shows that um, there is, uh, you know, a, a whole bit, especially in this connection between, let's say, the body and certain bodies and, you know, ideas of intelligence, goodness and merit, etc. There is such a whole, you know, bunch of assumptions that come with it that are incorporated in technology that that are incorporated into technologies that that also your work speaks to i think greatly um and i'm, I'm gonna just fly it you know from a slightly different angle maybe you know intersecting 
somewhat with what you said with the notion of art, because I think that's been something that we've been discussing a lot, the notion like, what is art? Um, and uh, not only, let's say, um, what are aesthetics or what, how, how have aesthetics come to be defined and codified as, you know, normative um, systems that are not, you know, normally, you know, talked about, etc. but also what are art objects? What, what are, what are, what, what is the difference between, let's say, value and valorization in art? And those are things that, you know, I want to try and speak to you. Um, briefly in the next uh, bit. Um, so I wanted to just uh, continue, let's say, slowly moving towards Flavia's line with talking a little bit more about the NFTs again, but let's just put it in the general question of what art is. So a perpetual issue that will be probed during these seminars uh, is what is art and what are art objects? You know, and this also relates to questions about authenticity uh, that we asked before. And that we will ask more, you know, during you know future episodes. Something sometimes we ask this question with sincere curiosity, as in really wanting to know what art is. At other times, you may detect a sarcastic tone. Mentioning it now because the answer we just found to the story about minting artworks and images as electronically signed coinage seems to suggest to us that art is actually a signed contract. That's what art is on one level and this answer that you know the blockchain is giving is thus in direct lineage with something like duchamp's hand signed urinal and with a legacy of conceptual art practices that for the time being seemingly empty art of sentimentality and pictorial motives uh, uh, to focus just on the agreement that existed with the viewer and in many cases with the art collectors and the the, the, the kind of art world um, Art here ultimately becomes art and is art because it is a possession to its owner. The feelings that it inspires are feelings that are associated with the exclusivity of the ownership experience. That's what one, one way in which this strand you know, has defined art. Um, and that those are different from the kind of sentimentality that's associated with the content of art. It's the ownership that generates the sentimentality here. These feelings on some level can be indistinguishable from love. Subtracting a particular incarnation of an image from public circulation and signing it into a blockchain contract seemingly resolves the question how an artwork can simultaneously be on the internet for everyone and have at the same time been monetized as a unique token, coin or electronic digital object. It is akin to an artist retroactively minting an original from which copies are derived, only in this case, the copies pre-existed the original. Technically, this all works just fine. Yet ultimately, the art experience here exists in the sensation of ownership experienced by the works collector. The idea, underpinned by demonstrably existing code, that this work exists just for them, for them alone. What we want to get at here is a point of order that in spite of attempts to get to rid art of sentimentality and make it contractual, a game of rules played with observers and owners and the gallery system and museums and even with other artists, sentimentality always seems to persist and recur. If not invoked by the content of the work, then by the feelings invoked by the contract. Think of a relationship's meaning being ultimately proven by someone weeping at the sight of their wedding certificate, even if there is no actual partner, just the certificate. In these seminars, sentimentality will be an explicit trope. It can serve us to ridicule art as well as to try and probe what is at stake. What does it mean to us? It's serious and hilarious at the same time. Timeless neutrals. Indeed, Sentimentality itself appears to be scolded at art school and in the art world, not, of course, because it has quietly left the building for good, but perhaps because of the can of worms that opens once we dare look into it and unpack what we, seem, what we deem to be quote unquote good work and why exactly. We're not entirely sure 
um, what Flavia is going to offer on this subject or, have, or has already done, and we actually now know that she's offered quite a lot on it. Um, this is the, the result of these things intersecting, you know, in a kind of intuitive order. But it could be along the lines that the notion of beauty, the notion of the good and the sentimentally true in art is constructed analogous to the way objectivity has been constructed in science as a disembodied notion that hides or camouflages the stake that the seers have in the scene. Donna Haraway, in a famous essay, insists on the embodied nature of all vision and so reclaim the sensory system that has been used to signify a leap out of the marked body and into a conquering gaze from nowhere. This is the gaze that mythically inscribes all the marked bodies that makes the unmarked category claim the power to see and not be seen, to represent while escaping representation. This gaze signifies the unmarked positions of man and white, one of the many nasty tones of the word objectivity to feminist ears in scientific and technological, late industrial, militarized, racist, and male-dominant societies. While we were texting about sentimentality, Flavia recounted that in many art schools, there appears to be a kind of nostalgia for olden days of Amsterdam's school and 20th century modernism. We could say that in this preference, almost seamlessly trans translated into a kind of Airbnb hipster hotel interiority. So there is an almost fluid, you know, transition from the preferences for this kind of like, you know, modernist sort of cool to this sort of Airbnb, you know, um, sort of like gig economy spaces. Flavia texted the following. I'd go as far as saying that timeless neutrals is colonial nostalgia. Only the sentimentality is masked behind the idea of style and minimalism. Intertextual sentimentality is sentimentality that only arises as such when it's alluded indirectly as part of a larger history that the viewer can instantly recall such as timeless neutrals recalls history of whiteness as the neutral, especially when neutrals are more often than not coded as variations of white skin. <clears throat> Within this ethos of sentimentality for white cubes and minimalist forms, weirdly, this is also the visual envelope that in this intertextual sentimentality is famed for being able to withstand quote unquote criticality already ridden of ornament and reduced to poor, pure concept, it is form designed to survive the art school version of critical inquiry, which is about the elimination of what was sometimes innocuously called unnecessary elements. Via mid-century design vocabularies, this minimalist formal envelope is teleported to the minimalist co-working homes and temporary rental spaces of the gig economy. Following this line, the purity ethos of minimalist design though traditionally narrated as, an, as the October revolution of visual form, indeed as a break with the Beaux-Arts and a revolutionary coup to construct a quote unquote new man, signified by chairs and ashtrays, all with a radically new look, that the purity ethos of minimalist design is actually the continued expression of a colonialist desire for control and whiteness sublimated into a code of neutrality. Daniel, I will say the same thing I said when you shared with me this uh, paragraph. You make me sound smarter than I am, and I am forever grateful for that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I no, put I there don't. in the chat the quote from when I was talking about sentimentality, and I will get back to this in my next intervention uh, because of how well it ties to what you were discussing. Um, Shall we take a five minute break so that everyone can catch up and go to the toilet if necessary and um, just five minutes to take a brief? I think that's great. If people are okay with that, we just take a little break. Yeah, no, I just discussed yeah. it with Eva. It was suggested because otherwise it's overwhelming. Another thing, um, we will be taking answers and actually opening up discussions at the end. So if you have questions, write them down in the chat 
And for the people that are following from YouTube, if, if there is anyone, uh, Eva will be also uh, looking at the uh, this, at, at the questions on on the chat there. So feel free to intervene in the chat and to comment or to say whatever we want this to be interactive as well. So we'll take yeah. five minutes. We'll be back at um, twenty past.
and I'm back. Oh my goodness, my cat will show in the screen any second now. Uh, you will all, I mean, you will all get the look of a tail probably, there it is. It's coming out of the Amazon boxes. <laughs> this is the spirit, Daniel. The Amazon boxes is the spirit. The, the warehouse spirit. Yeah, okay, so um, welcome back, everyone. Um, we have back, I think, all the Zoom, people, the Zoom audience. That's super. Thanks for staying. And we continue with you, no, Flavia? Mm -hmm. Great. It is now January 2021. I have been attempting to escape the pandemic confinement, but looking at pretty things. The unattainable, a world of luxury and solid gold objects that are not just financially out of reach, but also impractical and incompat incompatible with the life lived in jogging pants. Daniel tells me he watches videos of car reviews and I sheepishly confess that I watch endless videos of auditions for the singing competition, The Voice. It is in this never ending stream of talented ordinary people that I find comfort and horror in equal parts. Daniel poignantly says that maybe we both hope to see something about the culture at large in these videos. And there is one aspect that becomes painfully clear for me. Even if you are exceptional, such as many of the people in these audition videos, it is no warranty that you will succeed at this thing you do. So I sometimes Google the names of people who auditioned six or seven years ago to see what happened to them. I find their pages on social media, some of them thriving in a regular life, others just getting by. The brief exposure of their singing career never taking off to stardom. If there is anything I see in these videos, it is that we are surrounded by talent, but only a minuscule group will ever become famous for it. Just like a minuscule group will have access to these objects of luxury I am so drawn to. I read, it is easier for the rich to be moral than it is for the poor. Wealth protects the wealthy, but encourages the poor to take action. A rich man, for example, would never think of stealing bread. Only someone who is hungry but has no money steals bread. When the rich man is hungry, he has more than enough bread and everything else besides to quell his hunger. Likewise, a rich man with a car will never travel without a ticket on the subway. Aside from the fact that he could easily buy a ticket, he has a fancy car waiting in front of his fancy house. These words sound eerily contemporary, considering they form the basis of the ideology that got Trump elected in 2016. However, they are not contemporary at all. They were written by Joseph Goebbels in 1939 in a pamphlet called The Morals of the Rich. Just like the history of fashion has been built on the notion that being thin and able-bodied is a synonym of virtue, the market of the objects of luxury consumed by the rich is infused by this virtuous morality that has been driving the Western imagination since enlightenment. I read on the website of Moonshot Digital, a marketing agency that manages the likes of Maserati, Rimowa, and Jagger Lecoultre, how luxury needs to be distilled to timelessness. And I think of our ongoing discussions with Daniel about timeless neutrals, in the sense of these variations of white skin colors being coded as neutrals beyond time, a subtext of a never ending whiteness that somehow manages to transcend any interpolation or interrogation because it has coded itself as neutral beyond reproach. I see modernity, and by modernity, I mean the modernity as defined by Aníbal Quijano or Maria Lugones through the arrival of Columbus to the Americas 
as the zero hour of this timelessness of the white skin as neutral. The colonizer arriving to a new geography and positioning himself as the axis on which future empires will be built. The white skin that Fanon theorized made the jump from mere phenotypical characteristic to system of governance. And this completes your comments on the timeless neutrals oh, very well. Daniel. Absolutely, absolutely. That latest image absolutely did that. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think we could go on about those those luxury, uh, you know, tropes, uh, of course. Uh, but let me just uh, share my screen again. I hope you can see it now. Uh, I think one one thing that's really connected to the idea of uh, of uh, uh, the rich is not just their being rich, but also the notion of merit and meritocracy. Uh, and I think when we talk about meritocracy, we talk about um, a form of power that is also uh, largely sort of uncharted, un. Uh, because it's only measured by being good, but in in fact, you know, there's there's uh, there's 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 so much to be said about merit. This is a screenshot from a from a platform uh, called Mirror, in which uh, people can compete to be allowed to be on the platform, and when they are voted into being allowed to publish on the platform, um, uh, then they can they receive a token called dollar right. I mean, it is a dollar sign sort of S right with a dollar sign and they can write one piece and that's their, then they spend their currency. So it's one of those ways in which you can mint the social relationships and meritocracy into a platform, you know, kind of virtual currency. <clears throat> so to quote Flavia once again, this looks like things white young men are into. Flavia texts about NFTs. She's deadpan, unimpressed. This looks like things white young men are into. It's true. She's awfully on point. And it does look like the same type of divisions that have appeared between the NFT art world and the non-NFT art world are also appearing within the NFT art world. Someone on Twitter is angry because a user calling themselves the Global Art Museum has started minting reproductions of works from the collection of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, evidently, quote unquote, without permission. And on October 2020, the Rijksmuseum had announced to agree to returning a part of its collection to countries of origin in case the works in question were looted, something the museum calls involuntary loss. So they don't call it looting, they call it invol involuntary losing, involuntarily losing works of art. That was last year. Now the Global Art Museum with its Rijksmuseum collection of, of NFTs could well be a scam, but it has already made its point. The minting of JPEGs of looted art. Notwithstanding the fact that crypto may occasionally be a weapon of the weak, the surface that it unfolds and then colonizes is normless. And it's not normless out of an Free, free, let's say, uh, pre, a priori bad intent. It's normless because there are no norms for it. And that normlessness reproduces the normlessness that uh, is, you know, propagates with the colonization of territory. Let's file a looted artworks JPEG that's minted into an NFT under the politics of fake and fiction. Let's leave it here to be looked at in our second episode. So you think this is something we should come back to. The Kaleidoscope. The title of this series, Have You Ever Seen an Ugly Kaleidoscope, alludes to the aesthetics and ideas about beauty and ugliness that are unspoken component of what is taught and transmitted at art schools. But rather than going at these aesthetics directly, it's filtered, filtered through a pandemic, filtered through friendship and filtered through a liking for kitsch and sentimentality that we share, that we share with Flavia. In her book, Notes on Camp, Susan Sontag wrote, quote, I am strongly drawn to camp and almost as strongly offended by it, end quote. And she also wrote, quote, 
a sensibility as distinct from an idea is one of the hardest things to talk about, end quote. Both apply strongly to this series, I find myself thinking. A lot of what we share is on the level of sensibility. It's about being drawn and about being appalled. And it's hard to talk about this. And as Flavia explained, there's also mm, historical, um, historically entrenched ideas and notions ingrained in what we like and what we don't like that we need to examine. Some of the differences that might be found between our views on the same materials exist because our entanglements with them have been different. And the things therefore aren't really the same after all. So when you have a different entanglement, you ultimately have a different thing. But in the, this case, a difference in an interpretation does not lead to divergence each going their own way and never seeing one another again. On the contrary, they continuously rejoin like the patterns in a kaleidoscope. They're complementary. Funny enough, my whole next segment is about this topic of what constitutes the real. No? My research becomes entangled, not just with better havens, but also within my own research. I mentioned earlier how I have spent the past four or so years working on algorithms. And while our next seminar will specifically swim into the waters of what constitutes authenticity, I cannot separate these topics of luxury itself, class, fashion, and the neutral white body from other aspects of what constitutes fashion. Again, I insist my research becomes messy, entangled, and I need to tease out these threads in doses, each thread to weave into its respective theme. And I should be willing to rethread and revisit each of these across all of the, all, all of the different uh, aspects. Aside from the obvious aspects of algorithms and syst as systems of governance and biopower, I am interested in how algorithms are deployed in seemingly mundane tasks, specifically to replace the role of luxury fashion authenticators. And I quote from a paper called Artificial Intelligence is being used to combat luxury fakes. Once they had enough samples, their algorithm took over, analyzing the tiny details that make up the DNA of the genuine articles. And I want to stress this in the context of the history I have been discussing so far, the DNA of the genuine article. They, the, the, the people behind this algorithm posit that these details are too difficult for counterfeiters to reproduce. Entropy, the uh, company that has uh, created this algorithm, co-authored uh, co an article that states, even if microscopic details are observed by counterfeiters, manufacturing objects at a micron or nano level precision is both hard and expensive. Entropy CTO and co-founder Ashley Sharma completed a PhD at NYU specializing in computer vision, which allows computers to capture an object's microscopic surface data. Sharma saw the potential to use this technology to map what his company calls the genome of physical objects, the genome of physical objects. Interesting to me is that the founders published a paper with the title, The Fake Versus Real Goods Problem, Microscopy and Machine Learning to the Rescue, and that machines are being trained to detect simulacra at microscopic level. I quote from uh, the paper, we introduce a new mechanism that uses machine learning algorithms on microscopic images of physical objects to distinguish between genuine and counterfeit versions of the same product. The underlying principle of our system stems from the idea that microscopic characteristics in a genuine product or a class of products 
corresponding to the same larger product line exhibit inherent similarities that can be used to distinguish these products from the corresponding counterfeit versions. And I, I think I will go on to the next part because of how it ties to what you uh, discussed, Daniel. Um, I'm thinking in, uh, of Deleuze's difference and repetition particularly simulacra as the avenue by which an accepted ideal or privileged position could be challenged and overturned, and simulacra as those systems in which different relates to different by means of difference itself, especially in terms of class issues surrounding counterfeit goods. How if the simulacra is too good, it shatters the class signifier through which different relates to different. That is the rich signaling their wealth to fellow rich. But on the other hand, if the simulacrum can only be detected at microscopic level, how much of a simulacrum is it? At least in terms of delivering the class signifier it's meant to deliver. That is, if the copy cannot be detected with the naked eye, if it looks authentic and it serves the function for which it was created, then what is real? And I go back to the lens. The simulacrum is not just a copy, but that which overturns all copies by also overturning the models. And does this not mean that simulacra provides the means of challenging both the notion of the copy and that of the model? And in this, this ties to your commentary, Daniel, around the copying of looted objects and what does, what does the copy do in terms of challenging the validity of the object? And I quote from the paper uh, that this company uh, created. In the counterfeiting industry, most of the counterfeits are manufactured or built without paying attention to the microscopic details of the object. Even if microscopic details are observed, manufacturing at the micron or nano level precision is both hard and expensive. This destroys the economies of scale in which the counterfeiting industry thrives. Hence, we use microscopic images to analyze the physical objects. And they talk about something called feature extraction. Once the image is captured using the microscope uh, imaging hardware, it is split into chunks of smaller images for processing. Splitting an image into smaller chunks is important for multiple reasons. The field of view of the microscopic imaging hardware is large, and, they, and then the uh, software and the algorithm needs to look at variations in the 10 micron range. We are talking about the molecular structure of the goods, of the luxury goods that this uh, microscope analyzes. A super fake, that is a fake of such good quality that can be barely distinguished from the authentic. And then I think of Baudrillard, a simulacrum is not a copy of the real, but becomes truth in its own right. Feature extraction. I want to put the finger in this notion of extraction because if the cognitive machine is good at something, it is precisely at this feature extraction. In settler colonialism as structure, Evelyn Glenn writes, in classic colonialism, the object is to exploit not only natural resources, but also human resources. Native inhabitants represent a cheap labor source that can be harnessed to produce goods and extract materials for export to the metropole. They also serve as consumers, expanding the market for goods produced by the metropole and its other colonies. Goods and raw materials like colonists follow a circular path in classic colonialism. Extractivist practices have been extended to include not merely the physical, that is natural resources, but also data and intellectual property. In that sense, the algorithm serves a double function. 
it extracts data on one hand, but it also protects capital by detecting the simulacrum. Also worth noting that the simulacrum devalues the original by allowing access to the aesthetics of the real to the class of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. While the fake could be seen as having a democratizing effect, the algorithm is deployed to maintain the strict class division that only money can transcend. In that sense, the simulacrum devalues and corrupts the aesthetics of a certain class, even if simulacrum and real are identical to the naked eye. I would go as far as saying that the class division is maintained at microscopic level. And I will uh, stop here to pass back to you, uh, Daniel. Um, thank, um, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, yeah, I think uh, this, this exploration into this, um, well, into the granularity or the resolution or the, you know, in the, in almost the, the kind of the physics of the object in order to determine the, 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 the kind of like zone that's between the simulacrum and the real object, um, I think brings really fundamental questions for the, so what, what objects are, what, you know, and, and also with the power that's associated with these objects and, you know, the issues that you pointed at are like are. Um, but I, I think that the, the other trope that we could, you know, talk about in this series, um, that speaks to, um, I mean, we can say that we're interested in these things, but we can also say that we are, um, we, we some, on some level love these things. We can say that we, uh, that you do research into this for a certain reason, right? The reason is not only that you're interested in this analytically, but also that you have, that there's an affect connected to the, um, to, to the simulacrum. Is that correct, Flavia? It's just a question because I wonder just how to approach it in this case. Uh, it was clear from your talk what, uh, I mean, what are the fascinating implications of looking into this, but what is your connection to the, to the simulacrum of this, you know, in, in terms of like the fashion object in this case? I'm interested in how uh, the aesthetics of wealth are kept separate from the people that are not supposed to, um, to, to, to display this aesthetic of wealth. And especially in the history that I have already gone through um, of keeping certain bodies and uh, not having access to this uh, luxury because they are deemed non-virtuous enough to have. And I hope that it came through my connection between virtue and morality and having a certain body and having money and how these are intertwined and cannot be separated from well, our heritage of, of different forms of intervention. And in that sense, what I like so much about the notion of the simulacrum is because, I mean, this is deeply personal. I see myself as an interloper in a lot of these things. And I like that. I like that disruptive nature of participating in things that I have no business being part of. I, when I say I have no business, I'm talking about the way these things are coded. I should not wear certain things. I should not dress in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. Like so many other um, people of all genders across the board, but I'm talking about myself here and why this interests me. And there is also something uh, performative about being allowed access to the simulacrum. I can play pretend that I'm rich, even though nothing further from the truth, no? But I can play pretend that I have access, etc. And what interests me is that when I circulate in the street in public, there is no way of knowing if this simulacrum is real or not. The, by, by looking at me, and this is, you know, appearances can be deceiving, etc. How would you know what I am in terms of class or, or anything? 
just by looking. And that's why the, the simulacron interests me as performance, as class signifier, as so many other things, no? <clears throat> I suppose for Vinka and me to be part of the kaleidoscope with you is about wanting to follow up from words of Cornell West. The Cornell West uh, speaks about acknowledged dependence. Um, so uh, Cornell West, you know, is a really well-known, you know, U.S. scholar, um, religious scholar, activist, political theorist, um, uh, somebody who wrote like an enormous amount of books. Uh, has been connected to and is connected to several universities in the U.S., etc. But wherever he lectures or speaks, Cornell West always begins by lovingly mentioning his parents, the late Clifton West and the present Irene B. West. Uh, we can talk a lot about what that means, but in a way, these talks are about the same thing. And acknowledged dependence is not restricted to biological parenthood. It stretches into all kinds of relationships of nurture and reciprocity. The relationship with Flavia is of this kind, and the relationship we talk about in our conversations are of this kind. So I want to maybe this is hard because we're getting from a you know what I what I love about your analysis about the about the you know basically the the, the fake the, the kind of like the real and the fake in this regimen is also that it's a very material discourse. It's really coming down to materials, but you know, when we talk about art and when we talk about values that are carried by art, we, we need to, I think, also face to, um, you know, other intrinsic values that art addresses or can speak about, which, uh, you know, talks about ways in which we, you know, in a sense, relate to each other and not. And I think that in our practice, uh, visually, it has become more and more important to express these things, to express, you know, through, you know, objects, films and whatnot, these types of relationships. Um, and I believe that um, um, it's important to acknowledge this because we do not come from the kind of theory perspective or we do not come from the perspective where writing is our primary, uh, let's say, venue or instrument. We become very much from a situation where those things are are, are mixed and where questions that you ask about, um, well, that you wanna work at through your work, which are similar to questions you wanna work through in your life are somehow coming, presenting themselves in a certain format. And I think that that's the reason why I'm showing these, you know, sort of like textile works, which are, you know, we could look at them from the perspective of simulacra or not, but I think that's not primarily the point of why the works I want to share like a short episode of these works sort of dropping by you know, works like arrows and other works that are relatively recent. Um, but just to show that <clears throat> there can be interiority to uh, a motive about why you work, you know, in an art context or why you create works that present themselves in an art context. So the, 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 the questioning does not only pertain to things that are out there that we can, you know, try to understand and critique, but it also, you know, pertains to things that are sort of like interior to a certain way. And I think that one of the, the ways in which artworks can be interesting and powerful is by bringing those things sort of out in a way. So when we made our film Hometown in 2018, uh, we said that it was about complex belonging. You know, we said that it was about belonging, but then complex, you know, on the one hand, you know, I think that, that we could still stick to that description. Feelings of belonging are complex. The longing for home is complex. And there's no, no one could write a book about that quite like the late professor Svetlana Boim, you know, who wrote this, you know, brilliant 2001 book, The Future of Nostalgia, which uh, really problematizes the notion of longing from, from a, a, no, a number of perspectives. But having said, you know, complex belonging. On the, on the other hand, I wonder why must it always be complex? Is just belonging not good enough, right? Um, <clears throat> Flavia gifts Vesper a reading lamp in the likeness of Totoro, the monstrously funny forest spirit cat in Studio Ghibli's 1988 film, My Neighbor Totoro. Such a Totoro lamp 
delivered via the all-encompassing hydra of infrastructure called AliExpress is more than a mere toy and its meaning is more than mere entertainment. <clears throat> the love and nostalgia for the radically unfamiliar and the kindly monstrous, that too is this kaleidoscope and studying it is our task. We can talk about gorgeous neons here and not about timeless neutrals. Totoro, I have a backpack now to complete the Totoro. <laughs> Super. It's interesting why Totoro is 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 so so is such a you know um, a figure who sticks so much, right? With with one, you know, is not just because you've been exposed to it many times, or because they are as well known as certain other cartoon characters, but it's really just something about Totoro which includes. Um, which I would say that is the opposite of the Gucci video in 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 one in in the, in, in in some aspects. No, in in in, in, all, in every aspect. I think that for me, what attracts me to Totoro is the notion of monstrous tenderness. Uh, tenderness is always coded in this hyper feminine, stylized uh, figure. No, like something. We go back to the, the kind of bodies that are associated with these qualities. And then we have Totoro as this protective, almost nurturing, uh, I would go as far as saying genderless uh, entity for further luxury comforting. <laughs> Cesar, I know I cannot afford anything of that. I'm really, it's, it's terrible that collaboration. There is a low way. Uh, by taught by Studio Ghibli collaboration at the moment for luxury goods, uh, but I know where they sell the imitations. So, uh, but this is I, referring to a comment in the Zoom that, in the that, Zoom we're, chat, that we're yes. receiving. Yeah. Uh, what interests me about Totoro is this notion of monstrous tenderness, no? and the and the um, paradox of that body, that gigantic thing. Uh, that is capable of, of this love, no, in ways that sort of challenge aesthetic presumptions we have of who is capable of that kind of emotional and inner life. And that's what interests me about uh, the cartoon, why, why I'm probably very attached to it. Also because as a formative thing, when I was like 11, I discovered um, some of the mangas created by um, Studio uh, Ghibli later on. And they became, well, very formative to, to me personally. I would, say, I, go, I would go as far as saying that the reason I love Totoro so much is the same reason I love Godzilla so much. And uh, the figure of Godzilla as this monster, this destructive force, no? It's like, two sides of the same coin. And I'm, I'm not going to take any chat remarks about this, but Godzilla is a woman. I don't care what they say canonically, that King Godzilla, no, Godzilla is a woman. But let's move, <laughs> let's move into the next. Uh, you see, chat, I, I already see chat protestations there. I'm not going to respond to that. Probably provocations. Um, no, I think you get like endorsements now here <laughs> in the in the in the chat. But let's uh, let's continue. Thank you. I return to uh, Benjamin's arcade project. I read: fashion prescribes the ritual according to which the commodity fetish demands to be worshipped. Granville extends the authority of fashion to objects of everyday use as well as to the cosmos. In taking it to an extreme, he reveals its nature. Fashion stands in opposition to the organic. It couples the living body to the inorganic world, to the living. It defends the rights of the corpse, the fetishism that succumbs to the sex appeal of the inorganic is its vital nerve. The cult of the commodity presses such fetishism into its service. And then 
for the philosopher, the most interesting thing about fashion is its extraordinary anticipations. It is well known that art will often, for example, in pictures, precede the perceptible reality by years. It was possible to see streets or rooms that shone in all sorts of fiery colors long before technology by means of illuminated signs and our other arrangements actually set them under such a light. Moreover, the sensitivity of the individual artist to what is coming certainly far exceeds that of the grand dame. Yet fashion is in much uh, steadier, much more precise contact with the coming thing, thanks to the incomparable nose which the feminine collective has for what lies waiting in the future. Each season brings in its newest creations various secret signals of things to come. Whoever understands how to read these semaphores would know in advance not only about new currents in the arts, but also about new legal codes, wars, and revolutions. Here surely lies the greatest charm of fashion, but also the difficulty of making the charming fruitful. In the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, a priori, Benjamin seems to be mainly concerned with, with, with aesthetics. He focuses on the aura. For Benjamin, the aura is an unassailable kind of aesthetic presence of art, practically rooted and anchored in religious experience. He mourned the development of film and photography that eliminated it, leaving behind an experience devoid of the sublime. However, while he lamented this loss of aura, he also described something new, a kind of intersubjective experience of an object gazing back at us. Benjamin was, like Baudrillard or Deleuze, would be a few decades later, concerned with authenticity and simulacra. If the aura was lost, what replaced it was a new aesthetic experience, one that was no longer rooted in the sublime, but that exploited capitalism's need to position the individual as an isolated unit, self-contained, separate from the rest. If Benjamin's lament about the loss of the aura and the replacement of the sublime with the mass produced invited us to politicize aesthetics, the underlying concern of Benjamin wasn't so much about aesthetics, but mostly perhaps an ethics of art production and reproduction. I read Coates's commentary on the arcade project. Throughout the 1930s, Benjamin struggled to develop an acceptably materialistic definition of aura and loss of aura. Film is post-auratic, he says, because the camera being an instrument cannot see, a questionable claim because actors respond to the camera as if it is looking at them. In a later revision, he suggests that the end of aura can be dated to the moment in history when urban crowds grew so dense that people, passers-by, no longer retain one another's case. In the Arcades project, he makes the loss of aura part of a wider development, the spread of a disenchanted awareness that uniqueness, including the uniqueness of the traditional artwork, has become a commodity like any other commodity. The fashion industry dedicated to the fabrication of unique handiworks intended to be reproduced on a mass scale points the way here. And this is why exactly I'm interested in these uh, fashion interventions because the fashion intervention speaks of wider cultural phenomenon to which I believe fashion is pioneerly, is that a word, I don't know, uh, looking into before we even notice. Uh, but yeah, for now that's it, because otherwise I will go forever. All right. <clears throat>
<clears throat> our tired eyes and do we need more cinema in the same place where we zoom to make our eyes more tired? Cinema has already dispersed to the pedals of the electric car. So let's circle back to Gucci uh, and its release of cycles of short cinematic films in view of a catwalk show. Uh, this is, of course, the part and parcel of a larger package of, you know, strategies that have been used by fashion houses to replace the um, former, you know, centrality of the catwalk show with something that could be shared, you know, among streaming services and like YouTube and others. Uh, and this is Z Gucci's attempt, which we, you know, we already talked about. Uh, and in a sense, already Flavia has already already drawn, you know, the the overture that never even began by looking at the um you know the the phrenologies that that the that the fashion world really never departed from and that they never began to question um so if we look at the um at the videos by gucci uh what we see is that they are um I, well i had been quoted by flavia basically as saying that they were that gucci was sort of catching up with the times um and how do I feel about it now, basically? That's a question. Firstly, I think it was, it's very difficult to theorize or practice the ethics of ultra-rich luxury brands in a consistent way. And if anyone is doing that, it's probably Flavia who's capable of that. Um, so what happens on a non-interfit level, let's say that we should understand these videos, not just as, you know, intrinsically, you know, intrinsic carriers of values, but also as interfaces in the sense that, um, this is the interfacing side of the brand. It's the interfacing side of what, you know, what the organization is doing. Um, and, you know, what's happening on a non-interfacing or non-public side of the brand may be something else than what's happening on the front face, right? Yet, you know, um, we cannot say that Gucci is not simply, is simply pretending to be taking this step, you know, of releasing, you know, these videos with Paul, Paul Preciado, um, because it is really taking the step unmooring the brand from any anchors it may have had with the visible side of let's say the trump world that were you know it's not really behind us but that's slightly behind us in the sense of governance uh right now at least of the us uh, but of course still you know ingrained with it and tangled with it etc mm, so what do these interfacing narratives really mean to the non-interfacing side or to the infrastructure side of what a brand is doing labor relationships, et cetera. And, and obviously also the, the, the regimen of fake and real that is you know, maintain, maintained at all costs. But I'm, I'm interested or drawn to the cinematic quality and the carefully orchestrated imperfections of the films themselves. So besides the notion of, let's say, the ideal qualities or the way that phrenology has described um, um, like a kind of like taxonomy of properties that could be attached to people and that then become, you know, mechanisms of power and exclusion. Um, also, imperfections carry a role in this narrative, and I think they're they're much they're much less also much less um, looked at maybe uh, than should be. Um, but I but I think. As I said, you know, that the, the, the presumption that what we need is more cinema uh, for the interface or more cinema for a, play, a place that's oversaturated, like we are now with, you know, the, 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 the act of looking at, you know, material that passes by is, is something that's quickly leading to a kind of like overcrowdedness of that space, you know, so people are glued to their laptop screens. Um, and it's producing ever new sort of headaches and eye irritations. And I feel elated while writing what I'm reading you now, but I also feel a burning headache. I feel my eyes are burning. I want to go on my body. My body tells me I should stop. So it's like watching with a sort of like eyes that are, um, well, that are continually conditioned to the fact that they're always watching. Um, maybe it sounds a little bit overdramatic, but you get the idea. Um, so everything converges on the laptop, and that includes what was formerly in movie theaters. So let's also look at this as something that you know happens while the, the idea of a movie theater uh, is 
you know, suspended in a sense. So, for example, George Clooney's latest sci-fi feature called The Midnight Sky is, is a kind of Nespresso form of, you know, Tarkovsky Solaris. And it cost this film, which was released in 2020, cost a whopping, whopping 100 million US dollars to make. And it grossed 62,000 US dollars at the box office. And that was, of course, COVID's fault. Uh, but consider that the decentralization and diaspora of films away from the movie theater has been accelerated rather than invented by the pandemic. So the, the move away from the kind of centralized venues to, you know, a more, dis, you know, more dispersed idea of, of, of what cinema is, has already been going on for some time. And I don't mean to say that negatively towards movie theaters, I actually long to go to the cinema, and especially I long for experiences that somehow confirm there still exists a physical audience for art or for what art does. But most movie theaters, the ones that represent the industry, are conveyor belts to really bad industry films. And the dispersion of the cinematic away from any place where it can be centrally claimed or stored is what gives us play and pause pedals in a new electric Volkswagen. Um, they sort of embody the sensibility that everything is about film now but nothing in that dispersion is, is actually a film. You know, so there's, there's like dispersion, um, maybe at the cost of immersion. So the film, film is dispersed everywhere, but we are less and less immersed in it. And I think for me, that's the, sort of the background, you know, more the cinema background against which some of these, um, you know, film cinematic gestures like the Gucci films can also be seen. <clears throat> You see, Daniel, that uh, we said that all the threads would come together in the end, and that is exactly what is happening here. Um, I will share one last time uh, of this research, uh, a segment that I'm tentatively calling the Guangsu, the Guangsu Bottega project. Um, I left my last intervention with the words of uh, Coetzee in regards to uh, Benjamin's arcade project. And those words keep resonating, specifically when he recalls, and in my case, I would say he refills Benjamin's claims that film is post erratic because the camera being an instrument cannot see. I change my Zoom background every week or so, giving myself a new setting for the same staring at the screen that has been inflicted on us since March last year. And I wonder, is this a cinematographic gesture? Is this reclaiming of the soul slash aura that Benjamin like lamented? I go back to some of my latest preoccupations in regards to the ontophanic body. Students at the design department or at critical studies have already heard some of my reflections in regards to the ontophanic body, but I will very quickly and briefly rethread some of those thoughts here. Uh, Stéphane Vial, professor at the School of Design at the University of Quebec in Montreal, the author of this book, which uh, on the screen, the author of this book, which I highly uh, would recommend and I can share with you later on the bibliography, uh, speaks of the ontophanic body as such. Two decades of daily cultural integration with interfaces have demonstrated that virtuality or simulation is one of many aspects of our interactive experience with digital devices. A need therefore exists for new concepts once more apt at penetrated the philosophical complexity of the digital phenomenon and more likely to enlighten us as to the significance of our interactions with interfaces, given that these encounters constitute a phenomenological and existential experience. Thus, Vial says, I have suggested introducing the concept of ontophany whose etymology merges without any particular hierarchical distinction, the dimensions of being, the ontos, and of appearance, the finals. 
He bears witness to his profound attachment to Bachelard's notion of phenomenal technique, which he believes the term ontophany revives and broaders into a form of comprehensive phenomenal technique. Vial wishes to examine the unidentified technicality of the manifestation process through the prism of the contemporary digital field. Not only do the following theoretical propositions seek to contribute philosophically to internet studies, but also Vial hopes to give rise to a broader deliberation on technology and perception as they relate to an approach that he would characterize as, and I quote, a historical phenomenology of technology. According to this approach, technology is no longer a body of objects isolated from their subject. Technical nature becomes an intrinsic aspect of subjectivity among others, which varies in relation to its historical context. Man, woman in my case, is as much part of the machine as the machine is part of the woman. And here is the core of my interest in ontophany. I said many times that the virtual, this platonic notion of the virtual as separate uh, from the real is a concept that cannot be used to describe our relationship with technology. I believe that this is replaced by the ontophany that Vial mentions uh, in his own uh, research and theorizing. That is technology as intrinsic to subjectivity. Technology then has the power to generate ontophany. Um, technology then has the power to generate ontophany or phenomenality, the power to generate what can appear as real through perception. And while, like I said earlier, we will get into the murky waters of the real in our next seminar, I wanted to complete today's intervention with these reflections around the ontophonic body. That is the body whose intersubjectivity can no longer be separated from the technology, especially in the context of what constitutes real luxury, real class politics, real racial configurations in a historical process. If the body, our bodies, have been carefully taxonomized, and I believe this is a word that doesn't formally exist as such, but it should. So if the body has been carefully taxonomized following very strict racial, gender, and ability lines, then I am interested in how the ontophonic body itself or what I have called in the past in my own uh, research and writing, our bodies as data becomes part of the sub landscape. My cinematographic gestures remained as devoid of aura as Gucci's gesture of including coloniality as a fashion artifact when they still don't make clothes for the colonized body. Preciado's intervention might introduce these notions to new masses of people, but the subjectivity of the colonized remains uttered, separated from the quote unquote proper bodies that to quote from my points earlier, the bourgeoisie would naturally recoil in disgust at the sight of these grossly fat bodies, which in the metropole have become increasingly unacceptable. It is in this context that Guan Su Bottega, as I lovingly call this research project that Daniel casually named in some of our conversations, that how Guan Su Bottega seeks to excavate how these interdependencies of what constitutes the real, the beautiful, the colonial, and the constellation of taxonomies that make all of these facets of art and design. Perhaps, and to close down, I can be very irreverent towards Benjamin once again, when I say that his lament of the loss of aura was in a sense a foresight of what was to come. The machines reproduce our cultural foundations on a never ending loop. We taught them what to see and now 
like in a fever dream, they continuously remind us of what we value, what we discard, what we appreciate or what we hate. Look at this, this will please you, the machines say. And then Benjamin invites us to despair at the loss of the aura. But there is no aura because the machine is only showing us a mirror of ourselves. Thank you. What is that Zoom a graphic from what you showed previously with those jumping kids? Just to no, give no? I, I don't know. I found it and I, I yes, felt, you found it. I found it and I felt it represented. No, it was brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so the much. Second like, one course, is the, the second one which says my name is Zoom is from uh, the comic book villain, it's the arch enemy of the Flash, Zoom. Zoom is the okay. arch enemy of the Flash in the kids' show from the 90s. Yes, that's what Lovely. it is. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I believe your, your presentation was at least way more cohesive than, than let's say, ours. But I, I do want to um, um, follow up on what you just said, you know, moving to our next episode and sort of closing off the day, actually do have more to share, but another time. Um, let's, the last episode is called Each Their Own Chai Latte. Um, so some of the things that we said about art, uh, you know, aside from material qualities, properties, you know, aesthetics, etc., is to do with joy, you know, and you can say that um, there is a search for joy. And here we are not talking about art. In the next part, we're talking about how that search for joy and meaning sort of sublimates in some of these sort of everyday aesthetics that we encounter every day. And we maybe don't think about it, but there is interesting correlations to be made. Anyway, let, let me just uh, uh, introduce. Um, so the search for joy becomes sublimated into discount metaphysics. So for those who cannot afford the timeless neutrals or the timeless luxury of, um, you know, the, the kind of like styling that, you know, that, that Flavia talked about, there's, for, for those who cannot um, afford that, you know, there's pastel colors, esoteric gadgets, and a world of mindfulness coaching and beige. Um, and in this case, we're interested in a particular magazine called Happiness, written with a Z which is, uh, you know, in the Dutch newsstands. And it's the name of a sort of quote unquote spiritual lifestyle journal slash web store that oozes the same creepy purity vibes of chemically scented candles. So there's something here that wants to, you know, perennially, perennially remind you of purity. But on the other hand, there's that, you know, the kind of like discount metaphysics of that at the same time. Um, so there was Happiness Magazine instead of, you know, an art vocabulary or, or a poetic vocabulary. I think if you do not have, uh, you know, art, you, you have spirituality in, in sort of this form, you know. And it's sort of the progress from the idea of timeless neutrals to the idea of each their own chai latte. You know, you can aestheticize, you know, existence on that level. Um, and we also could call it blocker powered mindfulness and blocker is of course a you know chain store um and in our chat that we have with the three of us we argued amongst each other whether we should actually say blocker powered uh referring to this household chain store or whether we should say xenos powered and that's another chain store and it's a chain store that derives its word from, from the Greek, its name from the Greek word xenos and sees itself as, quote, an invitation to the exotic and colorful other. And it's selling, among other things, quasi-indigenous Latin American interior decorations. So li listen to the sirens. How appropriate. Can you hear the sirens? A bit, hopefully. Well, anyway. Um, and these are composed out of shells and feathers. Then we said we should say blocker powered because it sounded good. Um, and you know, these, these kind of like goods, which are look a little bit like, you know, indigenous artworks or something are actually close to the fictitious 
dream catcher tools uh, or dromenvangers, which happiness is selling just in case your child may be experiencing sleeping problems. And you see this dream catcher object here on the down on the downside of the image. And Flavia said about it, it looks like the remains of a chicken. And it does in a way, right? It does look weirdly sort of disembodied in a way. But I, it's interesting to speak about this happiness magazine, I think in, in the sense that it, that it speaks to a, a kind of very large group of people. Uh, and we are having a lot of fun with this everyday stuff that we can get to examine so much more closely now that we're all stuck here, you know, there's also some, some, something sort of like well-intentioned about these low rest sort of spirituality tools, no? Something helpless at the same time, or better said, something that's concerning, you know? So the fact that we're looking at these tools or this world is not to sit on the high seat and say like, this is, you know, bad and we're good or something else. But I think that when one avoids politics, you know, when one avoids asking why and how things are in the way they are materially, you know, like the questioning of the sneakers or the questioning of the handbags or whatever is a material examination of a, of a, of a design object that leads to a political um, designation at some point. Uh, but one also discards the possibility of art. What one may well end up with is interior decorations that replace the realm of religious faith with self-help placebos like, a, like this dream catcher. And in, in the next episode, we will connect these aesthetics, mindfulness coaching and so on, to some of the anti-lockdown demonstrations that we've seen uh, in recent you know, months, which are in turn also linked to conspiracy narratives you know, that we've seen. And these are, uh, in a sense, very important to look at when we talk about this sort of idea of the real and the idea of fiction and also the idea of fan fiction, for example. Um, so, like, it's that the interfacing side of the mindfulness culture has always presumed um, relatively strict divisions of race, class, and gender, you know, in the sense that each their own chai latte, you know, it's like something where everything is individualized, every affect of the system, every result of the system is individualized without taking into account that an unexpected flow of events, such as the pandemic, restricting physical gathering, preventing, you know, for example, you know, mindfulness coaching from happening, or something like that, might cause lives to suddenly fall out of joint with the neoliberal doctrine that above all presupposes a smooth space for transactions, right? So <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit more also about uh, film styles and to talk about, you know, dystopia as privilege, basically the idea that, you know, watching dystopian material all the time and surrounding yourself with dystopian narratives is a, is a, is a, is a form of precarious privilege. But I believe that this might uh, be better, better, you know, suited for one of the next uh, sessions. So I wanted to end with this one, with the idea of the sort of flat earth and the multiplication of, let's say, parallel realities and flat earth theories as a kind of like description of the now or a description of what's, what's been going on for some time now. Um, and with that being said, stop sharing. And um, um, yeah, that's it for now. Thank you, Daniel. And now um, we can maybe open up for discussion. Uh, the, the chat has been semi-active, a bit shy, but you can all jump or uh, you, you can all jump and uh, please comments, contributions, questions. I like comments as well. Eh? So, um, By the way, the dream catcher as a, as a headless chicken, those, those feathers this upset me. What do you mean it upset you? But it, it is too ugly, it's too awful. Yeah, I know, it's terrible, yeah.
yeah, in a way we allow ourselves, we have, we get to spend so much time with that kind of stuff now, no? Like just because we're always, we're stuck, we're always facing it. Um, yeah. Andrea, please, uh, if you did raise your hand, feel free to jump in. Hi, <laughs> good to see you. Uh, it's just a yeah, very random question. I wonder if you, because for me, the most strikely, striking layer of the Gucci videos was the fact that the sound was somehow distorted, distorted or like amplified. It, it was like, you know, you can literally hear uh, the, the clothes moving and like the bodies walking. And it's like, it's a very, for me, it was the most alienating thing on top of that the whole narrative is a bit fuzzy or like, I don't know, kind of scattered. I don't know if you have any thoughts about this, that for me, it was super impressive somehow and relating all these things that you've been discussing about, yeah, the monstrosity and the body and the zoom tiredness and the cinematic outside the cinema. Thank you for your talk. Fabia, do you want to? Um, no, no, go, go ahead, first? go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you, Andre. I think that there was also another question about sound in the in the chat, and I think that sound uh, is, um, you know, in general, it is of course a pretty sophisticated uh, cinematic, you know, production in every sense. So it it really plays with an audience with audience who sort of like are quite, you know, literate in a way. You know, it plays with levels of literacy that. Exist just on the level of the image, but also on the level of sound and knowing that say certain codes and working with that, it sort of like does that quite, you know, quite successfully, I think. So I think that, um, yeah, I, I think also that the, the sound layer itself, you know, but this is almost just technical, uh, is so important when, you know, the, 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 the actual experience of a piece of moving image is really discontinuous, you know, you might go on and off, you might walk away from the screen, etc. And sound is in many is often what provides continuity. So I yeah, I think it was pretty ingenuous. Um, but it, it also, um, you know, it, I remember, you know, vividly when you know, Nirvana was played in the Albert Heijn supermarket in supermarket for the first time, right? It, it shows you when something that that is a value that comes from somewhere else is played you know, on a major platform or supported supported by a commercial brand in a certain way. It also tells you like, what 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 is the future for <clears throat> marginal films, you know, when this type of um, content is what Gucci is now, you know, creating and, and providing to its audience with like millions of viewers. So every, all those gestures create uh, hierarchies of scale that I think are inherent to the system that we, we somehow have. Uh, and that's not a system that's in that sense um, as just as we would want it. So, so I think that we are talking, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about things with a lot of visibility. That's basically how things end up um, going. But I agree with you on the sound for sure. I think also another um, another aspect of the sound uh, could be to decouple the the, the the visuals from humanity. You know, the fabrics make noise, the objects, the walking, but that detracts from centering ourselves on the people themselves that make the video, you know, the, the the humanity of the. Maria is asking, I saw in your research a piece from Fashion and Death from uh, Leopardi. Would you update this concept? I'm not sure I, uh, I know, I, I don't know. Can you elaborate Maria a bit? This is a uh, question in the in the chat on Zoom. I'm not sure that the YouTube viewers can see that, but um, Maria, does I, I'm not, uh, what I think about the concept of uh, fashion and death. Oh, I have a lot about that, and especially Benjamin. I, the 
concept of fashion and death that I mentioned, uh, Maria, didn't come from Leopardi. It came from Benjamin himself. And I didn't want to quote too extensively on it today because I knew that it would be overwhelming with the amount of, of theory. Uh, but Benjamin makes a connection between um, the fashion spreads and dead female bodies and how uh, the body of the fashion subject, quote unquote, uh, can be compared to bodies that are post, post-mortem. And there's a whole section in the Arcades project about that. Um, if anyone, I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to link you to a PDF of the Arcade project where you can search uh, specifically on, on these because it's one of the most revealing and interesting things that uh, Benjamin had to say for me, especially because of how we could tie it, which Benjamin doesn't do, that's my irreverence, uh, how I would tie it to notions of gender and how the woman, because let's be honest, a lot of this fashion is directed as not as to any woman, specifically cisgender woman, and how the woman becomes this uh, body devoid of life. Just, uh, you know, that there is this idea that uh, models are just hangers. They are not people showing the clothes. And that's why they say that all the models are so thin, real thin, because they have to imitate how a hanger looks like uh, when the clothes are, are, are hanging there. So what it interests me so much that Benjamin breaks, brings up is this aesthetic. He goes as far as saying that there is a whole uh, genre of poetry from the romantics where uh, it focuses on body parts of the woman. Your lips are like this, your eyes are like that, uh, your arms like alabaster, I don't know. He goes on with several examples. And that then this disembodiment also adds to the notion of the woman as a dead subject, and he ties it further into fashion. I really, th this is something in Arcade's project that has absolutely fascinated me and, and blew me away. Um, Daniel, there is a discussion um, in something that Daniel Genser said from YouTube, and I think that it's related to the <laughs> Happiness Magazine. So, oh God, yeah, I see that. Yeah, um, yeah, but I think uh, Flavia, to be honest, I I think the one about the uh, the happiness, uh, let's say the the certain. Um, Mm, ways in which, um, let's say, mindfulness and spirituality has intersected with um, progressive politics, but also has uh, created a particularly a group that perhaps you know presumed that it was insulated from um, from solidarities with other um groups because um, i mean for, for i mean I, I could not feel in particularly the reason of that but i think that's something where you have great um material on right with also based on your earlier writings um so maybe you could say something about that uh yeah well um, the reason I'm interested in this spirituality, or the, the, what Daniel is calling in the uh, in the chat, a uh, spiritual bypassing uh, that eschews the political, I think that it, it doesn't um, smooth over the political. I think it resignifies the political, appropriates it, and repurposes it for a it's tied to this notion of neutral, no? It presents it in a way so that we don't perceive it as political, but it is highly political. A lot of these spiritual practices and huge quotation marks here are actually reappropriations and repurposing of Eastern traditions, Asian, Middle Eastern, that are brought here completely removed from any of that cultural context. So I don't think that this bland spirituality 
uh, sort of smooths or, or, or uh, brushes off the politics. I think it does something much more nefarious, which is it makes us unaware of the politics. It turns them into neutral pastels, which is the danger of these things, and we no longer see them for what they are as instrumental to other things, no. Um, but that, that's, that's my interest in, in, in all of these, or one of my many interests. Uh, Katarina wanted to also ask a question. Actually, I just wanted to add on top of what you said. Um, I mean, since we have your classes, I got very sensitive also for like all these ontologies and I thought it was, uh, this irony and when you um, introduce like the kibber body types into yin and yang bodies exactly what you just described there taking it out of its context and reusing it and then also uh, the irony in the title um, Daniel gave to like this individualistic chai latte drink when chai is just the word for tea and over like, a, like half of the world is just drinking tea and uh, yeah, actually, uh, Flavia, you already said a lot of what I wanted to answer to Daniel's comment as well. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for the talk. Yeah, what I want to emphasize is that maybe I am clumsy in the way I do it, but I want to expose the mechanisms through which these things are coded as quote unquote neutral or harmless, but it's part of a much larger uh, cultural mechanism of appropriation. And, and when I talk about coloniality and uh, the extraction, feature extraction, which I refer to in the algorithm, in the algorithmic sense, also applies to these cultural extractivist uh, processes. No, and and. Uh, I mean, we could go on, we could do a completely new seminar just on these topics. But yeah, I'm happy that you, you saw it and uh, that it resonated with you, Katarina. There's a remark from um, Scott about, I'm curious about the trajectory from the early remarks about violence and theology to homeland and spirituality. I'm, I'm guilty of having brought up the theology, so <laughs> I suppose I should be um, addressing that one. Uh, what I'm interested in terms of theology is precisely how theology is invoked as um, uh, something that informs the quote unquote Christian nation. And I use this as also a lot of the things I say should be taken um, in, in the context of the political implications of this, no? Uh, on the one hand, we have this theology which supposedly informs the politics of the Minister of Health. And on the other hand, we have a body politic that is not living up to any of the theology that it invokes as part of governance. So, of course, in these contradictions, there is a lot of messy things I'm interested in untangling and how they also, I mean, I use the word intersect a lot, but I, I think through lack of a better world, the, this is the best descriptor I can find, how they intersect with issues that are historical and historical processes. And I have spoken about uh, quite extensively in my classes, mostly about how I see these things as part of genealogies, very much in the Foucaultian sense now of looking at historical process. I do not look at the response of the pandemic today only. I look at 400 years of empire that lead to this moment. And in that sense, that's why theology interested me when I, I started the talk from that place, um, when, uh, which choices are made and in what context they are made. Uh, the, and, and I quote from the text that I used in my talk, the theosocial codifications which configure epistemologies, visions of life, and the mystical projections which relate human experience to the sacred. That exactly is what I tried uh, to tease out 
in the response to the pandemic and how it led to our talks with Daniel and our reflections on cinema and technology, you know, and how it is all entangled. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and that's perfect. And I, I'm curious about how that arrives to Daniel's work in Homeland and its uh, complicated relationship between Beirut and Ukraine and how does one find a sense of self within that uh, tangled mess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, like it was hometown. <laughs> Homeland is more well known. Oh, than so hometown. sorry. That's yeah, so why I, that's why. I... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, one, one, one uh, uh, question that I have, you know, perpetually with, 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 you know, throughout this seminar and throughout the discussions with Flavia is what is the potential for fiction uh, in, in this um, particular situation, right? Because um, we've, we've talked about, you know, the possibility of creating fiction, of writing fiction, the fact that uh, Flavia said several times during our chats that she's actually uh, has no patience for conventional fiction anymore. Like it should be correct, Flavia. Yeah. Sorry. Like I mean, I'm just trying to paraphrase you, it's, which I probably should no, not no, do. No, 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 no. You are correct. I cannot connect emotionally to conventional fiction. <laughs> Funny enough, it's a bit what you said about the NF NFTs. No. Uh, those are preoccupations for young white men. <laughs> Not that there isn't any kind, of, any other form of fiction, but I'm talking about the mainstream. No, that's what happens. I cannot connect emotionally with. Yeah. So, so, so the, I think then from that from that perspective, you know, you can say that you know, th there's there's weirdly some a thought that intersects with that that says that reality is so strange that we don't need fiction anymore because. You know, there's so much to, to, to disentangle and to examine, and there's so much craziness going on that, you know, who needs fiction in a reality like this? And on the other hand, we can talk about how fiction is perpetually necessary to, you know, uh, as a venue for, you know, our sensibility towards reality to actually change and move forward. And that's something that, that we're interested in on the level of, let's say, a film like Hometown which is not a documentary, is a fiction piece. Uh, and a fiction piece that's pretty messily entangled, I would say, with those sort of realities that it, that it, that it, that it deals with, but it doesn't represent. It doesn't represent those realities in a kind of way that a documentary would or you know, another film would. But I, I think that's maybe a discussion for another time because I'm sort of like, I think that the film would benefit from being seen first rather than from being discussed without people knowing, let's say, what, what, it, what it's like. But, um, <clears throat> you know, something I wanted to say but didn't get the chance to is that there is a weird uh, trope. Like on the one hand, we have the, the idea that art, mm, you know, becomes an exercise of, um, let's say, just repeating or mm, re reiterating aesthetic categories and presumptions that have been formed in these sort of 400 years of coloniality that 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 Flavia talks about. On the other hand, we have the, the a risk which I think also exists that our all art becomes a, a form of exposing technological or political mm, subject matter. Uh, with which you know makes art a form that let's say let me let me phrase it differently that art becomes a a, a vehicle in, through which nothing can be affirmed anymore but uh, only thing can be you know uh, things can only be not affirmed through art maybe that's exactly what art should do but I think that a quest for something that should be articulated something that um, is um, worth saying, let's say, is also simultaneously something that we've been searching for uh, and that we've also been sharing with Flavia. In fact, discussions around a, a next film called Chaos Theory is something that also, I think, was, was an important part of this episode um, and becoming a lecture series was discussions around script that we created, etc. 
Um, so I do, I'm interested in what fiction can be, you know, despite that I share the idea or the feeling that I cannot identify with fiction on the level of the kind of descriptions that, it, you know, you get on Netflix, et cetera, these sort of two line, you know, things. Funny enough, Daniel, the two pieces of fiction we discussed extensively in the last six months were the George Clooney movie and the <laughs> and Tenet, of course. And both, I mean, they, there are a lot of similarities there as well, not only because they are difficult movies, and I'm trying to use positive words here to describe a painstaking experience of watching them, I watched Tenet with you, I mean, <laughs> uh, but maybe, and I tentatively here uh, share a thought that I haven't really thought through too much. Maybe the problem is not that art can only um, offer tentative answers. Maybe the problem is that mainstream art, art or a film that is made by, you know, powerhouses, I'm not talking about the small filmmaker, has only offered us uh, certainties and subjectivities that are no longer applicable or, or even relatable to the majority of people. And that is the problem. It's not that uh, art should not have certainties, it's that the certainties that have been offered no longer fulfill any social or, or political role that is meaningful to most of us. Yeah, or, or we, we, yeah, I agree with that actually very much so, yeah. We have a, um, a comment from YouTube. I was thinking about the exhaustion of the laptop screen and how often times to rest from the laptop, we turn to a smaller screen, the phone, and how weird and contradictory that is. Or even worse, how we use both simultaneously. Yeah, I, I think, um, um... Like, do you have something about that? Like the, the kind of like multi-screen experience? Um, not much. I mean, um, it's, well, I, I briefly touched on the notion of this ontophonic body and how the experience of the virtual has changed subjectivity. I don't think, I mean, I don't think we're really changing uh, from... Yeah, physically we are changing from one screen to the next to deal with the limitations of the body, but the interactivity remains, for me here, identical. It's the same function, the same attachment, I would say, the same effect in any of the screens I use. I think that the... the the there's there's something to the fact that we are you know in on our screens you know and like then there's like the the laptop screen and there's like a phone etc and that there is something in which um there there is not the kind of physical immersion that is often talked about when we talk about augmented reality or virtual reality right there's there's much more a kind of fragmented type of immersion that comes from the sort of dispersion of the cinematic experience across many screens no and that's something that I think ideologically is more interesting than the idea of a sort of VR helmet, you know, because a VR helmet is associated with the idea of a kind of total illusion or a total simulation. But what is especially interesting with this idea of a more fragmented immersion is the idea that people have to make up stuff between those experiences, right? So if you talk about you do one thing, the laptop, there's the phone, that's almost a description of something where you have to fill in what's in between. And I think that's something that our next session will um, also focus on, that there's work to be done there for, for people that makes them part of, of something in a way that an immer a completely immersive experience is, is not, unless it's a game, which is, you know, of course, another logic very relevant to moving image. Um, yeah, so maybe, it's interesting. Maybe, and again, I tentatively try to articulate this, 
maybe the immersive experience has happened through a slightly different mechanism, which has to do with the collapse of the real, the collapse of fact, uh, fiction and, and factual. You, know, you and I discussed this um, and you said something super interesting in one of our discussions when I brought up consensual reality and this notion that we all agree uh, on, on certain facts, like the earth is round, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And there was always a fringe group that did not participate in consensual, consensual reality, but, uh, you know, it was fringe. But then you said something that I hadn't considered, and it was that consensual reality was not such, it was related to structures of power, like you said consensual for some, but some others never get to participate in the creation of the consensus. And, and I think that what, to go back to the screen, the screen has further um, aided in this collapse of consensual reality by delivering us fact and fiction in equal measures. And we become consumers of these in a flat surface that also, and I mean this metaphorically and very literally, everything becomes flattened to units of information con consumption. It doesn't matter in which screen you are. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think uh, there are some images being shared through the chat. Mm. That um, yeah, I think the the idea that you know there the the idea of a, of a consensually agreed uh, description of reality existing in a certain type of society, uh, you know, with associated with a certain arrangement of power and res responsibilities, is something that you know it started uh, maybe you know around the advent of or earlier you know with the advent of the internet you know the idea of newspapers as being the central corridor of the mediation of this reality you know and we would lose that and instead it would become everything would you know become like distributed and dispersed and like decentralized and everyone creating their own version etc so this lament has been ongoing and has been has been associated with the idea of the of the uh, breakdown of a belief in the legitimacy of let's say you know democratic uh, liberal democracy <clears throat> High from the OT group. Yeah, for everyone. It's that, harder. It's harder to harder to become a concert to be to concentrate. So, <laughs> for for everyone that is not on Zoom, I'm sharing uh, the image that uh, Lucas shared of how they are watching our talk in the <laughs> in the OT three hundred one space. So we are cinematic Zoom, Daniel. Absolutely, this is amazing. This is in a movie theater. Yes. Yeah. I have a question for you, Daniel. Do you think that we are bearing witness in a sense to um, cinematic Zoom or some form of uh, genre perversion? And I use that word very tongue in cheek. I think so. Yeah, I think. I mean, I could not. I, I think so. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm just thinking that from from the perspective of us, you know, being you know people that come into filmmaking from from the uh, the outside. To us, it's always seemed very strange that cinema and the film world maintains all these strict divisions of labor and roles and and let's say you know, hierarchies that, that do not make you know, a lot of sense for, for if you're like coming from the outside. And you remember that you, you realize that so much more is cinematic than is counted as film or as like industry film. So for me, like every new visual experience or every, in fact, every new experience that's mediated in some form is, is to some extent an addition to what cinema can be. And in that sense, we, we are do experience Zoom cinema, but we, we do not know whether that's good or bad in a sense, right? That's not something we can say. We can only say that we are, do, we are um, um, 
well, I mean, that reality in an expanded sense is cinematic. And that's something I believe makes it possible to see things, um, to distance oneself. And this is, you know, something we can talk about from the impact of certain things. You know, certain people are looking at things as if it's a film playing out, you know, or as if it's a fiction that's playing out, you know, uh, also signified by the word cinematic becoming like a, you know, something of frequently used, etc. So that's, you know, something that's interesting, but it, it doesn't guarantee that we can do make like interesting films with that or something. It's, it's something and it's, it's distinct from the notion of um, um, filmmaking as of now, but I think it, it would, it could inspire it in some way, but like we've already worked with zoom frames, for example, in one of the things we do. I agree with you. I mean, I see you on something you said. That doesn't mean that uh, we can make interesting films with this medium. But interesting films are not made with film either. So mm -hmm. what would be different? I mean, bad things are produced regardless of the medium. But I think it could be interesting. Um, the only thing that I am reluctant to accept in this uh, Zoom aesthetic is the uh, disembodiment, not the, the talking head aspect of it, which I, I I find quite unsettling. No, but that's the convention that came with the notion of, of using Zoom. But in fact, if you treat, treat Zoom as a simultaneous, having simultaneous access to a number of cameras, you could um, do uh, lots of other things with that that are not related to just seeing the upper, you know, the kind of like the particular framing that you get with Zoom. So I think that that's something that um, uh, that's open once you treat Zoom as a cinematic tool. In fact, we have you know worked with some people you know uh, to to at Zoom Cinema, a Zoom Cinema assignment last year, and they were asked to take out the Zoom camera into the world and to create two-channel film pieces with it, which you can do. But anyway, um, I think we're, we can um, wrap up, no? Yes, uh, if anyone has a comment, both in YouTube or here, uh, please. Oh, there, there's a question. For the OT people. For, for the Lucas. OT people uh, from A. Louise uh, saying, looks amazing, the cinema. Invite us for the next session. We're jealous. So this is immediately, you know, the, the films should be seen collectively, not individually, uh, each on their own screen, but collectively. Yeah. Um, but yes, otherwise uh, we will wrap up for uh, for now, and we hope that you have an interesting time, uh, and that you enjoyed as much as we did doing this. And we really hope uh, to see you in the next one. Uh, thank you, Vida, for, uh, for the comment. Thank you, Katerina, as well. Uh, Carmen. And Carmen. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, you know, staying around and, like, asking questions and being, you know, so much there. It's so appreciated. Um, and um, we, uh, we, we, we will, uh, well, make sure that there's, there's enough, <laughs> that there's interesting things as well for the next one, no? I think cinematic reality the monsters, monsters tenderness, tenderness team. That's me, that's me. <laughs> I also identify. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much to Eva for organizing this, for, facilitating and for all the behind the scenes work that she does so that we can have these spaces. Thanks a lot, Eva. Will you say a last word as well? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Flavia and Daniel. I think it was super amazing. And thank you all the viewers uh, who participated. It's really nice. And uh, we will have a next session on when is it again? Shall we say the date? 
I don't remember anymore. It will be on the website. It will be on on the the website, website, but I have it also here uh, on the 7th of April. So we hope to see you all then. And then for now, uh, I'm wishing everyone a very nice evening from their homes. All right.